Hello, Amish Furniture fans, and welcome to Episode 7 of the Amish Furniture Podcast. I'm Beth Rice, co-host of the series from the largest online retailer of Amish Furniture, Dutch Crafters Amish Furniture, where I have worked for five years. And I'm Ilka Rivera, your other co-host, and I've worked for Dutch Crafters for four years. For those of you tuning in for the first time on the Amish Furniture Podcast, we give you insights into, if you haven't already guessed it, Amish Furniture. From misconceptions about Amish furniture and what it's like to start a business selling furniture made by the Amish, to Amish women's roles in wood shops and how Amish furniture is made, we explore that and more on the show. The topic we are exploring on today's episode is Amish entrepreneurship. And to help us do that, we are ecstatic to be joined via Zoom in our respective makeshift studios by a special guest, Dr. Stephen M. Nolt. Dr. Nolt is a native of Pennsylvania who holds degrees from Goshen College, Associated Mennonite Biblical Seminary, and the University of Notre Dame. He currently serves as Senior Scholar and Professor of History and Anabaptist Studies at the Young Center for Anabaptist and Pietist Studies at Elizabethtown College. He's a frequent source for journalists and researchers seeking information on Anabaptist groups, and he is the author or co-author of 15 books that primarily focus on Amish and Mennonite history and culture. Some of the books that he authored include A History of the Amish, which is in its third edition, as well as The Amish, A Concise Introduction. He notably co-authored Amish Grace, How Forgiveness Transcended Tragedy about the Amish schoolhouse shooting in the village of Nickel Mines in Lancaster County. And a few other co-authorships include the books Amish Microenterprises, Models for Rural Development, and Amish Enterprise from Plows to Profits, and a paper titled Amish Enterprise, The Collective Power of Ethnic Entrepreneurship, which we'll mention a few times on the program today, that appeared in the Global Business and Economics Review. Those last three titles tie in nicely to what we will be talking about today, so let's get into the episode. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Nolt. Milka and I are pleased to have you on today. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Well, you've graciously agreed to join us to talk about the Amish history of entrepreneurship and business, one prominent small business being furniture making and in turn the production of furniture. Would you first please tell us and our listeners how you became interested in Amish and Mennonite culture? Uh, I grew up in uh, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Uh, I had Amish neighbors, and I'm uh, from a Mennonite family myself. So uh, I suppose in that sense, I, I had uh, came to it naturally, I guess you could say. Um, although my my academic interests um, ended up going more in the direction of broader themes in American religious history and American immigration and ethnic history. But at a certain point, some of those uh, those topics and themes kind of circled back around to uh, some of the communities that I was um, most familiar with uh, growing up. I uh, lived for about 20 years in, in uh, Indiana, in northern Indiana, and got to know the Amish um, throughout Indiana and other parts of the Midwest. I'm now living back in Pennsylvania and uh, reconnecting with uh, some of the Amish folks here. So let's get into today's topic. Um, we're going to be touching on the history of Amish entrepreneurship and then entrepreneurship itself, and then hopefully getting into woodworking a little bit too, since that's our main area of interest. So the Amish were historically agrarian. They were farming land since before their migration to America. Um, what are some of the factors that led them to moving from farming to other businesses, or have they always been entrepreneurial and interested in other things? You're right. The, uh, the uh, Amish economic history is really a history of agriculture. And with a few exceptions here and there, um, Amish folks were uh, historically farmers, both in Europe and in, um, and in North America. That said, I think uh, farming itself, uh, if small family farms are, you know, by their nature, often very entrepreneurial. Um, uh, today, we may think of agriculture in terms of agribusiness, of um, uh, you know, a farm of 5,000 acres doing, you know, one crop or something like that. But uh, historically, small family farms were involved in a lot of different things, and they changed what they grew in terms of uh, crops and animal husbandry uh, from year to year, certainly from decade to decade, depending on market demand, depending on family labor that was available. In, in the winter months, uh, farm families would pick up uh, 
extra uh, work, be that um, in the colonial era, uh, weaving cloth, or uh, maybe uh, more recently, um, uh, building trades, or again, to connect with, with uh, furniture, some sort of woodworking, that sort of thing. So farming uh, often went hand in hand with other kinds of economic uh, pursuits. So yeah, the uh, Amish people have this heritage of farming, but it's also uh, very much a, an entrepreneurial heritage. And did they always sell to outside communities or just, you know, when they were farming and they were making all these other items too, was it mainly within their own communities? Amish economics has uh, often been uh, closely integrated with uh, surrounding uh, economies. One of the reasons for this, and one of the things that we um, maybe forget uh, today, is that the Amish population historically was quite small. If we go back to 1900, there were only about 5,000 Amish folks, adults and children, uh, in the U.S. and Canada. Today, there are about 350,000 um, Amish people in North America. Uh, and so in some ways, the Amish economy, the, the more internal Amish economy, is uh, in some ways stronger today, actually, than it would have been in, say, 1900. There just wasn't a large Amish market. <laughs> and it's, it's actually that, that population growth that is related to some of the shift away from farming. So... Um, over the course of the 20th century, uh, given large uh, families, uh, typically Amish families today have six or seven children. So Amish uh, families are larger than typical uh, family in the US. And uh, about 80 to 90% of children born to Amish parents join the Amish church. So when you have large families and a high, what we would call retention rate, uh, you have a, an exponential growth curve in terms of population. And that's how you get from 5,000 Amish people in 1900 to more than 350,000 today. So at a certain point, the, the ability to, to acquire land for farming is outstripped by that population growth. In, in most Amish communities, the kind of pivotal decade for that was the 1980s. So particularly in the 1980s, you see not, not Amish people leaving farming, but during the 1980s, you see the rising generation, young people who are getting married, starting their own homes, not going into farming in the first place, but rather starting, um, starting small businesses. And again, it's uh, there's population growth that's outstripping the availability of land. You have um, also in the 1980s in some of the same uh, rural communities in which the Amish had historically lived, the emergence of uh, suburbanization that was also taking uh, farmland um, out of the market as there were, um, you know, housing developments and, and commercial, uh, other commercial development happening. So a number of those things are, are happening at the same time. There, there's some movement in the 80s for uh, Amish people to leave geographically and start new settlements elsewhere, and we still see that happening across the country today. But the establishment of new settlements in more rural areas has never been uh, enough numerically to take the demographic pressure off the older settlements. So the shift uh, away from farming to small business uh, has been pretty common in the last uh, 30 to 40 years. Today in the Lancaster, uh, Pennsylvania Amish settlement, about one third of um, household heads under age 65 are farming. Um, in northern Indiana, it's actually less than 20%. But uh, today, it's probably fair to say on a national average uh, that less than half of Amish families are farming. Certainly, there are communities you can go to where, where almost everyone still is farming. But on the whole, uh, it, there's definitely been a marked shift away from farming. Interesting. Thank you. Now that the Amish have largely moved away from farming, what are the most common types of businesses run by Amish entrepreneurs? The shift away from farming uh, drew on a lot of the entrepreneurial heritage that they brought with them from, from farming. So uh, some of the first things that they um, became involved in were things having to do with what we might call machine shops and actually buying older farm equipment that uh, they could retrofit or rework to fit with horse farming. Woodworking then was another early area. And again, drawing on a tradition of off-season construction trades, uh, perhaps furniture making. So uh, woodworking, um, including furniture building, both outdoor furniture, uh, indoor furniture, cabinets, uh, and would have been another area. And then we also uh, saw by the 1980s, well, by the 1990s, about 20% uh, of uh, Amish small businesses in the Lancaster community, at least, were 
uh, being run primarily by Amish women. And those businesses tended to focus on things, again, traditionally tied to women's work, whether they be fabric stores, um, people who are just retailing, um, retailing fabric, but then also uh, people who are making and selling fabric uh, crafts, be they quilts or um, other sorts of things, uh, small retail stores, um, small grocery stores, bulk food stores, those sorts of uh, sorts of things as well. So those were some of the main main areas that that uh, emerged in the in the 80s and that we would still see today. Could you maybe give us like a percentage of how many businesses are you know woodworking businesses? Since again, that's you know kind of our area of expertise. Do you have you know kind of a number? And is that still a really popular business to start nowadays, or has that shifted a little bit as well? So the percentage of, of Amish um, households working in woodworking uh, would vary from one community to another. Here in the Lancaster settlement, my best guess is that about 10% of Amish businesses are uh, in woodworking, if by that we mean, you know, things like furniture. So that that may not, 10% may, might not sound like a lot, but the, the number of businesses, the kinds of things people are now involved in, are, are really very broad. So 10% is actually a sizable uh, clustering uh, here in this area. Um, in uh, say in Northern Indiana, um, the dynamic is a little bit different there. Um, actually, uh, unusually for, for the Amish population as a whole, there is in Northern Indiana, a sizable number of Amish men and a few women who work in non-Amish industry, actually um, working in uh, factories that are are manufacturing recreational vehicles and other sort of component parts. So um, again, you'd find the percentage of of Amish um, folks working directly in woodworking to maybe appear relatively small, like ten percent. But uh, as far as a clustering of Amish owned businesses, it's it's uh, it's pretty significant. No, that's that's great, and I think that's something that we've heard a lot of too. You know, where a lot of our Amish woodworkers actually started working in the RV industry, and then when you know the economy collapsed a few years back, they got into woodworking. It just seemed kind of like a natural, or making furniture. It just seemed like a natural thing to do, or you know, their father had been a woodworker and taught them how to make the furniture, so it seemed like a natural transition. So yeah. Yeah, uh, in in northern Indiana, there has been a bit of a shift away from uh, factory work and towards uh, small business uh, since 2008. Um, actually, not quite as much of a shift as I might have predicted back in 2008. But uh, first, with a spike in in uh, gasoline prices in 2008, and then with a major credit crunch in 2009 uh, and the onset of of, of the recession. Uh, the RV industry really contracted for a time, and so there were um, there certainly were Amish men in that northern Indiana area uh, who had been working in non-Amish industry who uh, decided to to start their own businesses at that time, and many of them went into uh, furniture making. We've heard a few stories from some of the woodworkers who've visited our showroom in Sarasota also and spoken to us about their furniture Um they tell a little bit of their backstory if we if we ask, and some have mentioned that they just were not cut out for farming, and this is how they got into <laughs> turning to to woodworking. We um we sometimes mourn the trends in the furniture industry that move toward cheaper products, uh, poor materials, and bad construction techniques. In contrast, Amish woodworkers seem to be devoted to creating outstanding products that will last for generations. To what do you attribute this commitment to to quality? Well, there's a. Uh, I think there is a, a long tradition and heritage and and cultural value on quality and integrity, hard work, just a, just a general work ethic uh, that you bring from the farm. That I think would all be part of that. Amish limits on technology, although they're not always as limited as as uh, some of us uh, may assume, but but certainly there are clear limits on on technology that Amish folks use. I think also increases a commitment to handwork and to looking at, you know, just spending time with materials, <laughs> spending time looking at wood, and how does it look? Um, you're, you're working more closely with the materials. Uh, and I think that can be, uh, can contribute to a concern for what the finished product looks like, what it feels like, uh, how it's put together. Uh, so I think that lack of mechanization uh, also is, um, is, is a part of this. 
Um, you and your co-authors noted in your 2010 paper, Amish Enterprise, uh, which we will include a link to in the show notes, that the failure rate of Amish businesses in the first five years is just 10 percent compared to 50 percent among small business startups nationally. To what do you credit that success rate? I mean, one, one thing that I might uh, comment on that, that I think is uh, germane to Amish businesses generally, including uh, furniture makers, is that there's this dynamic in Amish business between what we would call ethnic resources and ethnic restraints. So in the kind of larger world of uh, um, ethnic group economics, we often talk about the, the role of ethnic resources. So in the Amish case, that could be things like uh, heritage of uh, entrepreneurship from the farm, uh, work ethic, uh, the use of family labor, like multi-generation you know, families working together, simple lifestyle uh, that that reduces overhead. Um, um, there's a strong commitment to uh, mutual aid. Uh, in a, we think of this in terms of classically in the in the rural context with the barn raising, but it plays itself out in the Amish business world with church-based mutual aid that is um, more cost-effective, frankly, than commercial health insurance. Uh, and yet provides a lot of the same coverage. So these are these are our ethnic resources that uh, contribute to the success of Amish businesses. On the other side, there are also what we would call ethnic uh, restraints or, or constraints, um, limits on technology, limits on formal education, uh, a humility theology that often keeps businesses small, maybe smaller than than the market might suggest they could be. You know, other small things we might mention, like, uh, you know, no Sunday sales, prohibition on, on being open on Sunday, things like that. So we could list these these ethnic restraints. Um, and I use the word ethnic. I mean, these are from the Amish perspective, religious restraints. But so we have these ethnic resources and, and ethnic restraints. And one of the things that's interesting in the Amish uh, case is that these restraints are what from a kind of from a you know an MBA perspective would be considered uh, restraints and maybe unnecessary restraints on business growth have for the Amish actually become resources. That is, all these restraints have uh, contributed to greater attention to quality, to funneling production into, in, in, into to certain um, niche fields, and overall to creating uh, an Amish brand. Um, so these the, the, the interplay between resources and restraints in the Amish case, I think, from a business standpoint, is interesting because the, the things that might classically be considered restraints have actually become resources that have helped to bolster the Amish brand. That's interesting. Yeah, I know. That's, I feel like that's not surprising to hear when you hear about how much the Amish community, you know, you mentioned the barn raising, how much the Amish community comes together. Um, but it's still, yeah, like Beth said, really interesting to hear that they, you know, will help out other like businesses in that way too. Um, and that kind of leads me into my final question about this um, how has the shift towards furniture making and other just business ventures in general benefited the Amish communities? Well, one of the ways that this has uh, benefited the community as a whole is that it is in some ways economically easier to be Amish today than it was, say, 75 years ago. So this uh, I think came up earlier in, in one of our earlier comments here in which uh, you mentioned that that uh, some furniture crafters have have uh, just said, well, they're not sure they were cut out for farming, uh, and uh, this seemed to fit a little better. So the, the range of occupations in which uh, Amish folks find themselves is still narrower than the population at large. They're, they're not, um, you know, they're, they're not high school or college graduates, so there are certain professional fields that they're not going into, but they're going into a wider range of occupations, certainly, than, than their great-grandparents did. You don't have to be a farmer to be an Amish person today. So I think that that, that wider range of, of um, economic uh, and occupational uh, possibilities for uh, men and now for some women as well is um, one of the contributing factors to the, the remarkably high retention rates in the Amish community. Again, 85 to 90 percent of children born to Amish parents joining the Amish church, that can seem a puzzle from the outside. And in fact, that rate of retention is a bit higher uh, than it was 75 years ago. Um, and I think one of the one of the reasons is that uh, it that, that there are just there are more occupational opportunities available for, uh, for Amish people today. Certainly, the the um, the shift to small business away from farming has uh, provided more um, cash income in 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 the Amish world. Uh, so, um, rather than say uh, 
a more of a, of a commodity based uh, wealth that you'd find in farming that might only be uh, liquid certain times of the year. Um, the, the Amish business world uh, is more of a, of a cash economy. And so one sees that in the way in which mutual aid is now practiced. Uh, so cash based funds that uh, can be used or accessed for paying for medical bills, um, also for Things like building Amish schools, uh, building Amish schoolhouses. So in the past, this uh, was, if there were, as the community grew geographically, more children are born, you needed more schools. It often fell on the parents of those children to uh, pay for construction of a new school. And that still is the case some places. Um, but uh, nowadays, it's, it's uh, more common for um, uh, wealthier Amish business people, particularly those of uh, maybe of, a, of an age in which they actually don't have school aged children anymore, <laughs> to uh, anonymously provide the money for building a new school, which is which is a great uh, help to the parents of school aged children who are often at a life stage when they don't have a lot of extra cash. I love that they just keep sharing within the community, which is lovely, just keep raising up that community, which is, I think, something that we tend to lack nowadays, where you know, we have that very individualistic approach to everything. And so that's really nice to hear. We're going to change gears and talk about some of the restrictions that Amish businesses uh, may face based on their community rules, values, or expectations. In the paper Milka mentioned, you and your co-author said, the Amish accept capitalist values, but these are mediated somewhat by the norms and regulations of the ethnic community. What norms and regulations impact Amish entrepreneurial pursuits and the ways they run their businesses? One of the questions that I personally had a number of years ago going into this research in Amish businesses was whether there were any formal limits on the size of a business. I remember very clearly talking to one uh, grandfather uh, here in Lancaster County, and I said something to him about, you know, is it you know, what, what are the limits? Is it uh, too big a building, too big a payroll, too big a sales volume? And and he said, I think the main limit would be if you get too big of a head, uh, in which he was kind of coming back to the idea of, of humility and the important role of humility in, in Amish life and that uh, individuals who, um, uh, who may be quite wealthy, but who maintain a, a humble outward demeanor, who are very generous with what they give and actually give anonymously, uh, treat their workers right, and so on, may have a very large business um, that, by any number of measures, uh, and be uh, quite respected in church community. And someone might have a smaller business, not be expressing that sort of humility, and may feel community pressure to downsize or, or you know, uh, sell or, or, or something like that. So I think this role of humility, it's a little hard to put a number on, it's hard to quantify, uh, and yet uh, it's, it's, really, um, it's really pretty important. Now, having said that there really aren't formal limits, I think from one community to another, um, based on the, the, the church order, or in Germany, say the, the Ordnung, or in Pennsylvania Dutch, the Atning, restrictions, say, on technology do provide a kind of practical limit, a practical lid on the size of, of many communities. So businesses that rely on third parties to advertise or third parties to do computer um, work for, say, sales tax or other sorts of things, um, there's just kind of a, a practical limit there to, to what it is that, that uh, that they're going to do and how they're going to grow. Um, certain communities have have limitations on uh, the kinds of technology that they use that make it difficult to move into you know certain kinds of woodworking. So woodworking, for example, um, the most conservative Amish communities in terms of technology, their woodworking tends to be around sawmills or making shipping pallets or you know things that are things that are really pretty rough or or further uh, further back the supply chain. Um, Amish uh, communities that have more leeway with the kinds of technology they use and that maybe would have a large uh, diesel plant from which they run hydraulic and pneumatic power into a shop are going to be able to have more uh, variable power equipment. Um, again, they're still they're going to be doing more handwork than you'd find in a fully mechanized non-Amish shop, but they're going to be able to have 
have uh, equipment with more, more variable power that's going to enable them to do more finer variability on everything from sanding to routing to uh, planing and, and all sorts of things. So those, those, kind, of, those kind of practical limits uh, put a limit on the kinds of work that's done, um, you know, how much one can charge and who the, who the, the ultimate uh, market is. There's also a um, there's also a, a pattern, and this is this is something that's a little harder maybe to put put one's finger on, but is something that pops up again and again, and you hear stories, um, and that is almost an expectation that uh, sizable, thriving businesses will, from time to time, uh, spin off a part of their business, maybe a particular product line, maybe a particular segment of their market to um, to one of their employees. It might be a child, it might be an adult child, so it's staying within the family, but it's it's splitting, or it might be to another employee. And so kind of keeping businesses small by spreading out that entrepreneurial activity um, rather than you know one business continuing to get larger and larger is also a, um, an expression, I think, of mutual aid and an expression of of uh, value of humility. It's a kind of culturally strategic downsizing <laughs> in which a growing business divides and is spread out among other family members or other employees. We mentioned uh, some of the titles of the books Dr. Nolt has written or co-authored. If you're interested in learning more about Amish and Mennonites and their communities, search for Dr. Stephen Nolt. And as in Nancy, O L T as in Tom, to find those. Um, are there any resources from your own catalog or outside it that you would especially recommend to anyone like interested in learning more about the Amish and Mennonite history, um, you know, culture, entrepreneurship, and all that? I would also be happy to send you our um, our Amish studies page here at the Young Center, particularly the the section on statistics. We find that's the section that's most used particularly by journalists, but is of interest to, to people. Um, so we update that every summer. Well, a publication that, that listeners might be interested in is a, a publication called Plain Communities Business Exchange. Um, it's published uh, here in Pennsylvania. It's published by an Amish family. It comes out once a month and um, there's a lot of ads. So it's, it's a great way that Amish businesses can communicate with each other uh, about you know, who's selling what, what's available. You also have non-Amish businesses who want to connect with Amish uh, firms. Uh, maybe they're selling wholesale component parts or whatever. And you can get a good range of the kinds of businesses that people are involved in, some more agricultural, some more uh, maybe to a tourist market, um, woodworking, metalworking, um, equipment, all sorts of things. I'll we'll definitely have to check that out. Yeah, it yes. sounds really interesting. <laughs> Keep that in mind, listeners. That's the Plain Communities Business Exchange, and it's a monthly publication if you're interested in learning more. We would like to thank you again, Dr. Nolt, for joining us today for a very enlightening conversation on, on Amish entrepreneurship. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you again to Dr. Nolt for joining us today. I'm looking forward to reading some of his books and learning more about Amish and Mennonite history and culture. Um, before I go on a book buying binge, though... Do you like my alliteration there? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Beth. <laughs> I love alliteration. I love those practices. Um, what is something new that you learned and or a favorite thing from today's episode? Oh, my goodness. What a great discussion with Dr. Nolt. Um, you know, a couple of things popped out. I liked when we were talking uh, earlier and he mentioned this the stat about 20% of the businesses being run by Amish women earlier. On. Yeah. And that was, I, I think he was referring to the period in the 80s too. So that was some time back. Um, so I found that that quite interesting. But um, one of my favorite things that I just thought was really provoking was when we asked him um, what he would attribute, you know, the success of their businesses to, you know, when you compare them with the failure rate, you know, of other businesses. And he talked about their work ethic and their limiting technology. And I was thinking to myself, man, if I could just turn these electronics off, what else could I accomplish and how much more I could get done? And, you know, you always have these excuses thinking, 
you know, oh, well, when the kids are grown, I'll have plenty of time to do X, Y, Z. And this yeah. is what's taking up my time. And just that, um, you know, that commitment to a simple lifestyle and shutting down the technology and, and setting us, I need to get one of those baskets, you know, where you have a family function and they say, put your phone in here. And then no one's allowed to be on their phone. While well, you're yeah. having the <laughs> they have but, safes, I think, where you can lock it. That you can put your phone better. in there and then lock it. Yeah. And then you can't use it <laughs> for a certain time. <laughs> but it just struck me, uh, you know, that when those things are removed, you know, look at look at what they've done and how successful they are, how unique and, and the great quality they produce because they are focusing more on on the what they're doing in their craft than any distractions. So, yeah, that just stuck out to me. What about you, Milka? What is something new from today's discussion or a favorite thing that popped out for you? So I guess my big thing is, is that even though I realize that the Amish are evolving and changing along with society, you know, there are certain aspects that don't change, but it was really interesting to learn kind of how Amish businesses have changed over the years. You know, it went from farming into, and even then they were, it sounds like they were somewhat entrepreneurial then, you know, and, you know, he mentioned that the Amish communities were small, um, so they couldn't necessarily just sell within the Amish community itself. So that was really interesting to learn about, you know, even back in the day, you know, we live in Sarasota, so we oh. see the Amish out and about, especially this time of year, we're seeing a lot that are coming down for the winter. And you see them still dressed, you know, the women are dressed in their long dresses and they have their head coverings on and the men are still wearing, you know, dressier pants and suspenders and long sleeve shirts. So, you know, I think sometimes we see those things and we see them riding around on bikes. And so I think sometimes you see that and you think that they haven't necessarily progressed in some ways. And then you hear Dr. Nolt talking and also just from working in the furniture business, you see how the furniture evolves over time too. And then you realize they're evolving too. You know, they're entrepreneurial. They want to keep their businesses thriving. And it sounds like a lot of times it's to help their own communities too, to keep their communities strong and growing. Um, so that's really interesting to hear. It is. All right. That's it for today's show. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to like it or leave a comment or a review. Also, please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And be sure to join us next week for another exciting episode of the Amish Furniture Podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Until next week. 